Hello everyone, Tashi Delek, hope you can hear me. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. And so today we have a live stream and I wanted to focus primarily on this teaching on the preliminaries that's coming up. Of course, if you have other questions, that's also okay. But this is an opportunity for you to clear up any kind of uh, doubts you have or considerations. Thank you, Mick Squirrel. I'm glad to hear you can hear me. Hello, Jeanette. Hello, Matilda. Hello, Mary, everyone. So, so far I haven't received any questions specifically. Hello, Bradley. Have we met before? You might be somebody new. Oh, hello, Paul. Nice to see everyone here. Okay, so uh, while I'm waiting to see if you have any questions, we'll just uh, talk a little bit about the preliminaries. So in general, what are the preliminaries or this mundro? That means that which goes before. That's the beginning of the pra practice, the preparation. Now this is standard pretty much in all traditions of the Tibetan Buddha Dharma. It's very common and this format is similar looks almost identical, whether it's Sakya, Nyingma, Kagyu, etc., Gulukpa, then they all have preliminaries and they all have particular uh, characteristics or types. Now, what is it the preliminary to? It's the preliminary to the main practice. So in Dzogchen, that would be the preliminary to uh, the Dzogchen practice, right? And we're familiar with this text. The most famous text is Words of the Brahman Perfect Teacher. Words of my perfect teacher is actually a form of preliminary, and that's what these teachings are on. It was Patra Rinpoche's own Lama who taught these instructions as a preparation to learn Dzogchen. And in the Kagyu tradition, that's my tradition, then we typically use the preliminaries that were written by Jamgon Kontra Rinpoche. So Jamgon Kontra Rinpoche was famous in that he kind of distilled all the various t teachings from the Buddha Dharma and put them together, primarily so they wouldn't get lost. Um, and so he kind of compiled lots of things, and one of the things he compiled was these teachings on the preliminaries. And he also wrote a big text uh, called The Ocean of Definitive Meaning, and that is the main practice of the Mahamudra. So these two go together. This is called the torch of certainty, or the lamp of the definitive meaning, depends how you want to translate it. And that goes along with another book called The Ocean of Definitive Meaning. And that's the relationship is the preliminary, the preparation, and the main practice. And it's the same with Sakya. So they practice Mahasandhi or whatever, and they have their preliminaries, and they look very, very similar. Do we need to purchase or download a text? So. That's a very good question, Mary. Very practical, scientific and pragmatic. Get right to the ABCs. Um, so let's see, this is the text here. Let's have a look. Oh, let's hope this works. Hello, okay, here's the text. Uh, this is the uh, outline, for example. And here's the cover of the book. So as you can see, this is from Marpa Translation Society. And it was translated by Karma Kunga. He's the main attendant for my teacher, Kimbo Labo. If you've seen Kimbo Labo's pictures, then uh, Kunga is like his main translator and his uh, main attendant. And he's been studying this particular topic for many years and he's been doing this translation for, God knows, uh, maybe 10 years he's been translating it, long time. And in, in my view, then it's the best one available, 100%, because it's all done under the guidance of Kimbo Labo. And Kimbo Labo is very clear on all the meaning of everything, so it's good. Um, the other translations aren't aren't bad in any way; they're good. Uh, Kempo Chopel, Kempo David has made a translation, and that's that's very good, equally as usable. Um, but I think Kunga's is better for some reasons. Maybe they're comparable these two. But anyway, this is the text, and um, these are the topic. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Now, uh, Kunga said that if we start before it's available, I think it'll be available mid-May, then we can use the PDF. So there is a PDF 
that I have we can use to get started if we start before this one's actually published. And then um, there's also an ebook version. And as you know, ebooks are cheaper, right? So really we do have to purchase it because we shouldn't really steal people's <laughs> intellectual property. Um, and the thing is, this um, MARPA Translation Society that we set up in the retreat center in Nepal has got various principles. And one of them is that we're not doing it for profit. So it's not a way of making money. Now, most of these Dharma books are really expensive, and that's because they sell them, they pay for the publishing, but also they make some profit that they invest in various things. And sometimes it's just investing in other translations. But one of the directions that Kempu Labu, my Lama, gave us is that 100% should be in no way in danger of selling the Dharma. So we can't make any profit on it whatsoever. And that means that the text itself is really affordable. But, um, so, you know, many of these things are available online as PDFs, but I think these PDFs have basically been kind of stolen and put on the internet. So in general, it's not a good idea. I think in 10 years in retreat, I didn't do any shopping. The only thing I had to buy was books. Now, to give you an example, we had to buy some specific um, material related to the six yogas of Naropa. And it was a little pack of things. It was like $150 or something completely ridiculous. And my teacher was just completely, you know, astounded at the way we do it in the West. So anyway, I don't actually know how much it costs, but it's going to be very affordable. And also it's going to help. It's going to, the money will go for something useful because our MARPA translation society is one of, some, one of the most ethical translation societies. And we're translating a load of stuff that doesn't exist in English. You know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of volumes and things of text in the Tibetan Dharma, and many of them haven't appeared in English. And if they have, then a lot of the translations are a bit kind of dodgy, to be quite frank. They're not very well done. And we have a team of maybe, I think, 20 or 30 translators. And we all have work to do. I have a text I'm translating. And, um, and Kempu Labu, my teacher, is very, very strict about it. You know, the standards have to be incredibly high. So I think it's, uh, I mean, we have to buy it. Anyway, we can't steal it. And um, we can use the PDF in the short term. But if you, wanna, if you don't want to buy an actual hard copy book, and I know Jeanette's going to want the real book because she prefers to read real books. Many people are like that. I also prefer real books. The problem is, now that I'm getting old, my eyes aren't very good. It's difficult to read. Uh, then you can buy the ebook, and I think the ebooks are really cheap, right? You know, it's like five quid or something, you know, seven dollars or ten dollars. I, I don't know, I can't say for sure, but it's going to be really affordable. So, yes, this is the text we're going to use. We need it, it's really important. And also, it's something that you should practice and keep all your life. So, this text is kind of our equivalent to words of my perfect teacher, right? So, some of you are familiar with this, this text. The Patra Rinpoche's text has a lot more kind of. Um, so we call troche. It means elaboration. It's where the teacher goes into more kind of details and gives more examples and things. So Django and Control Ribeshe's text is very concise, but it's a very practical uh, manual. They're called instruction manuals. So it's like a manual for fixing a car. Anyway, uh, let's see. Although morality is important to many people, people may wonder why it's, it is why is morality and practicing bodhicitta so important for meditation. Uh, what's love got to do with it? Yeah. Okay, BJ. So we'll just uh, drift off topic. Now this is related to the Ngondro, because in the Ngondro then we have to study loving kindness and compassion. So the key point here is that in the Mayana, motivation is the most important thing. Now in uh, the Theravadan or the Hinayana tradition, then the most important thing is your conduct really. It's whether you do an act or not. But in the Mayan, it's all about uh, what your motivation is behind that. So we hear various stories associated with that. But in the Ngondro, in terms of the preliminaries, one of the main aspects of this is developing the mindset of bodhicitta. And so if you have bodhicitta, then basically whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever you think will be virtuous if you have actual uncontrolled bodhicitta. But you have to be careful 
because it can be, you know, it sounds easy, right? If I just have love and compassion, but we often don't recognize our kind of inherent motivation. We don't often recognize what the basis of our motivation is. So for example, in the Buddha Dharma, many people come to these teachings of the Mayana, they hear about bodhicitta, loving kindness and compassion, and they think, well, I'm a Buddhist now, I have to act in this way. And what they do is they outwardly try to project an image of being kind of saintly or having love and compassion, but their motivation is to be seen good in the eyes of others. And so that's hypocritical, right? So this notion of hypocrisy is very, very strong in the Buddha Dharma, something we have to avoid. In Tibetan, it's like outer and inner should be the same, right? How you say something to somebody's face should be the same as the way you talk about them behind their back. So this is a really important aspect, and this is related to the practice of preliminaries. Uh, the preliminaries, in many ways, seems to be quite mechanical in all these things you have to do. But if you're doing it correctly, what should happen is you transform your baseline motivation, your baseline outlook, so that uh, you act in a non-hypocritical way, in a very honest way, and uh, you engage with reality based on this honesty. And this comes from understanding the four thoughts that transform the mind. So the very preliminary of the preliminary is these four thoughts. And if you have these, then you will not fall into hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So what is the importance of conduct? Isn't love enough? That's sort of your question. Well, you need to fake it initially, because basically we're, our mind's very tricky, and usually we're um, kind of deceiving ourselves. We're motivated or we act in a way uh, in order to be liked or in and hope for reward or return. And so initially what we have to do is we have to kind of constrain ourselves in a contrived way. And in the Theravadan or Hinayana practice, then they take robes and they uh, kind of go live in isolation and they condition themselves to not getting angry, not getting greedy, not being jealous, not giving rise to pride, etc. And um, for example, they will be punished or chastised for acting in a negative way outwardly Right? You can't see what's inside somebody's mind. But on the basis of this, then you become habituated to it. And this is what the preliminaries are all about. They're about habituation. So the reason why we do 100,000 of this, 100,000 of that, so many repetitions of mantras, is not just to count them up to 100,000. 100, right? The purpose of it is, is to condition ourselves. And if you are doing it properly, then you condition yourselves. If you have bodhicitta, if you have uncontrived relative bodhicitta, not ultimate bodhicitta, then yeah, there's no problem because you won't engage in misdeeds. But don't kid yourself on. Most of us don't have uncontrived bodhicitta. Most of us uh, don't really understand what that means. Uh, and, it's, and basically you have to study bodhicitta to understand what that means. Hello, Bradley. Hi, uh, Matilda. When will this teaching take place? So... The book, I think, is going to be published in mid-May. So that could be a, a good time to do it. Um, really, we should pick an auspicious date, and I haven't really looked into it yet. If I look at the um, calendar, then I, I, should, I think and in May, there's a, if Sagadawa starts by that time, a special holy celebration of the Buddha Day. So basically what I have to do is I have to look for an auspicious day in the calendar, right? And I'll find it. But it's not going to be in the next week. It's going to be the very end of April or the beginning of May at the earliest. But I think I'm aiming for mid-May, um, probably at the start of this special holiday. I'm not exactly sure when that is yet. I haven't had time. My brother's been visiting with his family and I'm kind of had too much to do. But... Um, it will. You've got plenty of time to prepare, and we've got plenty of time to get the text and everything mailed. Uh, and like we can start without the actual hard copy, right? You can start with a PDF, and then you'll get the real thing in the mail as soon as it's available. Also, um, there are standard prayers that we will do at the beginning of every session, at the end of every session, and those are the same ones we use in Sekar when we do teaching sessions. And uh, so it will take place one day a week, 
right? I mean, ideally what you do is you like do sessions every day for a month, right? But we can't do that because everybody's got busy lives. So I've got to kind of choose the best day for everybody, right? And so far it seems to be a Friday or maybe something on the weekend is better for people. And then we uh, do that every week. And maybe one month, it'll only be three weeks. It'll be one week off possibly if um, there's a problem. For example, if you contact me a few weeks in advance and say, oh, I've got this thing on on that day, then we could possibly move things. I don't want to do that too much because then everybody's going to be asking to change it, right? Basically, unless you can really commit, you're really sure you commit, then don't get involved. It's too much trouble for everybody, right? It's only people who are really sincere. And also, uh, you have to make a commitment to it, to, to do the actual practice. But maybe somebody's asking questions about that. So let's see where we are. How many sessions is in the course? Yeah, it's not certain. At the moment, I'm thinking it's going to be minimum two months. Um, and it depends. I have to decide what depth I'm going to go into. Like, I could do it very quickly if I just give you the kind of mechanical what you do at what time kind of thing because there's all this stuff like prostrations and things you have to do. If we just basically said the outer aspects, we could do it very quickly. But that's not the way I'm used to receiving teachings. That's not the way we usually do teachings if we're doing it authentically. And then the teacher will give a lot of pith instructions, so that's stories and things relative to the teaching of the preliminary. As I said in many of my videos, people think the preliminary is just about doing so many thousands of this, so many thousands of that. The true way of developing the preliminaries is to give rise to an understanding of the practice. And in order to do that, then a teacher needs to give all kinds of metaphors and examples and also give direct instruction to the students, right? So often what happens is you'll be, uh, the teacher will be teaching about a certain topic, like karma cause and effect or something like that. And the teacher might pick up a student on something because they were displaying a lack of belief in karma. And so the teacher might actually directly say something to a particular student. Now it's difficult for that student, but on the basis of that, other students get an idea in their head, like they'll, they'll see the relevance of it. So that sort of thing, pith instruction takes longer. Um, so minimum two months, maybe maximum six months, but I will give you more details once I've worked it out. You know, uh, many teachers are very good at this. They'll just divide up the text in a certain amount of time for each day, and they'll just go through it like that. And that's generally the way it's done when teachers travel to different countries, because they've got a fixed time, right? They've got a weekend, or they've got five days at most, and they have to do it that way. That's not the best way to do it. In the retreat center, then my lama was teaching uh, Words My Perfect Teacher for like five years, right? So it's like the text never ends. It's because there's always more detail you can get into. You want to make it more profound and more deep. I don't plan on doing it for five years, by the way. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. So actually doing the preliminaries will take minimum of a year for you to do it. So if you're going to make this commitment, it will take the minimum of one year to do that. <clears throat> and it, But it depends, right? Certain people have different levels of ability, right? Some people aren't able to do prostrations, but that doesn't stop you from doing the preliminaries. You know, if you're kind of young and athletic, right, Mary, <laughs> then you have to do all your prostrations. <laughs> you're not getting out of it. You can't say, oh, I'm too old now, I'm 30, right? But I mean, I have students who are elderly, and, and it's the same in the retreat center. We have um, Kempu Labu, my lama's aunt, is there. She's like in her 80s now, I guess, but she does her prostrations every morning. They're slow, it's a slow grind. Um, you know, and she's got lots of health issues, but it, this is the way with the Tibetans. I was in um, McLeod Ganj, you know, Dharmasala, where the Dalai Lama was, and there's all these beautiful old Tibetan women, you know, they're like 99 years old, all wrinkly face, black skin, and they'll do their prostrations, it's like, Urgh. it's like five minutes for one prostration, and then they'll sit down, and then they do the next one, but they do it every day without fail. They're so diligent. They're so sweet. So you, basically what it depends on is how uh, you commit yourself, how sincere you are. If you're really sincere, you will benefit from that. But again, you know, for somebody who's in their 70s, who's got a bad back, they can't do the same as somebody who's 30, who's like, a, like scuba diving, right? Who's like really athletic. So 
you kind of have to decide for yourself, but you do have to make a commitment. The most important thing is you make a commitment to yourself and then you stick to it. For example, I'm going to do, in the retreat center, we do 100 prostrations every morning without fail. And this uh, Asu, which is Lama's aunt, or, you know, she does, always does her prostrations, even if it's going to kill her. So you have to have to have to have that mindset. That's the way the Tibetans are. That's the way it is in the Buddha Dharma. What if all happens spontaneously? Well, if you spontaneously become Buddha, then um, you can teach us. Right? I asked about when because we are in different time zones. Yeah, okay, time of day. So Matilda's pointing out that we're all in different time zones. So there's some people who are in Europe, for example. And that means uh, we'll start in Pacific time. We're going to start quite early. Now, in the retreat center, we have the same problem, right? The retreat center is in Nepal. And there are people all over the world who follow the teachings. And I have to say, that's the people in the UK were getting up at 2.30 in the morning to join the te teaching sessions, right? And having a nap. So this is the kind of dedication you need, but obviously we're going to try to avoid that. So I was thinking uh, Pacific time to be early. Now the weekend's probably best for most people. It's really important that you send me messages and tell me what's good for you. And I'll try to hit the time that's going to be most useful to everyone. Uh, so I know some people on the East Coast are able to do, you know, Friday afternoon, early, stuff like that. So if I start maybe 10 or 11 Pacific time, that means in Europe it's not too late. So it's got to be kind of as late as possible on Pacific time so that it's not too late in Europe, Eastern Europe, etc. I mean, there's one guy in Malaysia he wants to join. So for him, he's going to have to be up in the middle of the night, but he's willing to do that. I spoke to him the other day and it was two in the morning there. But I think in Malaysia, they kind of sleep in the day and they have, they stay up late at night anyway. So maybe it's easier. So we've got to work it out between us. And um, we have time. Like I say, the first session will be, the first session will be open for everyone, anybody who wants to join so they can get an idea and they can decide. So you can join the first session regardless. And then you have to make up your mind. And then there will be a password. And only the people who make a commitment will be allowed. And if people break their commitment, they'll be chucked out, unfortunately. That's how it has to be. Because this is basically the preliminaries. It says the preliminaries, but this is really serious. Uh, this is what you need to do if you want to be a serious practitioner. You need to do the preliminaries. There's no other way. Especially if you want to go on to study Ma Mudra or something like that. You absolutely need to do the preliminaries. And you have to take it really seriously. The way my lama is about it, it's basically, you know, this is the most serious thing in your life, is this kind of commitment to practice. So people make arrangements to visit our retreat center in Nepal. For example, I'm sending Karma Dorji there. I think somebody else wants to go as well. And you have to book it a year in advance. And they expect you to give them the exact date that you're going to show up. Date and time when you're going to show up. They'll even pick you up from the airport. Um, but if somebody then says six months later, oh, I've got a, I've, uh, I've got a work engagement I have to do, you'll, he'll just laugh at you. He will never let you back in the retreat. It's because the most important thing to you is your worldly life, right? And practice is second. If you're like that, then, you know, it's probably better that you don't um, get involved. It's just a headache, right? Okay, Om Mani Pemi Hong. Yeah, so the one we will do is Om Ben Sato Hong. That's the uh, mantra we will do 100,000 times, which is the purification mantra. Anyway, there's reasons for each of the levels. Uh, so, I don't know, Matilda is like um, one in the afternoon on Friday. I, you, we have time for people to arrange their work schedule around the teaching times. So right now we have to decide, is it better Friday or Saturday or Sunday? I think those are the three days. Midweek, I think for most people is difficult. And then we can work out a time. Gala, I'm happy to participate. Any day is good. This time is good too. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's going to be around, Pacific time will be about 10 or 11, I think. I can go earlier, but I don't know if that's going to be useful to everybody. Are you thinking of setting an ongoing group or will it end after a few meetings? I'm not sure what that question means, Matilda. So we'll do it on Zoom probably, because it'll be private, right? It's going to be private, uh, only between us, teacher and students, and uh, 
everybody who makes a commitment has to see it through to the end. Of course, if you, you know, get mortally ill or something like that, let's say a family member dies, you say, oh no, you know, my brother died, I've got to go to the funeral, then we'll just, what we'll do is, we'll still have the session, but we won't talk about the preliminaries. We'll do a general teaching session, everybody else can join, we'll just do with instructions. So we won't break the actual teaching itself, that's the most important thing. The reason why we don't break the teaching is because let's say you're studying a topic and you break it in the middle, then what will happen is in future, that karma will kind of resonate forward in future and then you'll always find interruptions, especially with that specific topic. I've witnessed this myself and my teachers talked about this loads. It's so true. Uh, for example, the Vinaya, right? So I was studying the Vinaya in Nepal and I came here to look after my parents and that teaching has been broken and there's always been obstacles with that. In fact, that was the same for my teacher. He had problems with the Vinaya. He, at some point he had to miss the teaching and then he could never get through to the end. There was always some obstacle come up. So it's for your own sake. Uh, what are the working questions we should have in mind in order to have the right attitude to join? Well, the right attitude to join is this. I'm really serious about the practice, right? And uh, I need a kind of to up my game. I want to make it more profound. Um, the basis of all of this is recognizing that one needs to find liberation. So these are the m methods for finding freedom and liberation from samsara. So if you don't want it, if you don't want to be free from samsara, then you don't need to do it. So it's the preliminary to the main practice that is Mahamudra, right? Now you don't have to necessarily have this wish to practice or study the Mahamudra. In fact, that's quite difficult but you have to have this kind of wish to practice seriously. And if you are, then the preliminaries are a good thing. The preliminaries are always a good thing. Let's say you don't want to spend the rest of your life practicing meditation. Still, it's beneficial to do the preliminaries, but you do have to commit to doing the preliminaries and seeing it through to the end. So many people, they get a commitment from their teacher and they say, I'm going to do the preliminaries. And it's like, I'll do it over one year. And then it's two years and it's three years. And then 10 years later, they still haven't done it. That's a real trap. Don't get into that. You've got to kind of uh, set a time frame in your head and try to meet that. I've met people like that. In fact, there was one guy who I was in retreat with and um, he didn't even finish his preliminaries by the end of the retreat because he got stuck in this strange mindset. Uh, and that sounds quite strange, right? You've done the entire retreat thing, but you actually didn't finish preliminaries. There's a trap. There's all kinds of traps like that. You have to be careful. They're kind of, what do you call, mess up your head kind of traps. Specific meditation focus during the course. Yeah, so we'll just quickly um, show you the uh, text here. So here's the uh, contents, right? So this is the actual layout of the course. You can see this on the screen. The first is the four common preliminaries, right? Which is the four thoughts that turn the mind from samsara. So the first one is difficulty of finding the leisures and opportunities. What these leisures or leisures and opportunities are is the things that make you qualified to be a precious human existence, to have a precious human existence. And a precious human existence is someone who is able to seek liberation and practice. So in the past, then uh, people with physical disabilities had a lot of difficulty in this area, right? We didn't have braille, for example, right? We didn't have kind of learning aids and accessibility aids and, and things like that. But these days it's not a problem. Uh, for example, for my mother, it's a problem, right? She has dementia or Alzheimer's. So people like that, if you haven't got control over your mind, there's just no way for you to practice the, um, the Buddhist path. There's other things you have to do. For example, you have to try to seek a, a better rebirth in the next lifetime. But for somebody who is, uh, let's say, wheelchair bound or something like that, that's absolutely no problem uh, in terms of st studying Mahamudra, etc. Uh, main thing is you need to be able to understand, you need to be able to hear. And if you don't have ears, then you can still, mm, these days, you can still have access to the teachings. So you have to be able to sort of hear or learn what's being taught. And then you need the ability to think about that rationally yourself. And that's the most important thing. So the four preliminaries, the first one is this leisures and opportunities. Uh, it's kind of learning to appreciate or be grateful for the opportunity 
to uh, practice the Dharma, um, to recognize that, oh, right now, there's no reason why I can't practice. There's no obstacles, right? Like I don't have uh, Alzheimer's, for example, so I'm able to think for myself, and I have the means to study the Dharma, etc., etc., etc. And then you first step is to recognize that on the basis of that, then you can apply yourself. And then we have these other meditations. Meditation on impermanence is the second one, and then karma and causality, and then the faults of cyclic existence. So this is the first part of the teachings, and these are our first contemplations. And so there's actually quite a lot that needs to be said about these topics. So it will take um, at least one session each, but more like two, and maybe even three session sessions each, you see, for these. If I just skim over it, we can do it in one session, but that's not very good. We need to talk about these things, like uh, what is an opportunity? You know, What's the opportunity to hear the Dharma? Well, one of these, for example, is a Buddha was born. Right? In our kind of universe, there was a Buddha and the Buddha taught the Dharma. Without that, we wouldn't have the opportunity. You get the point? Uh, leisures, for example, is I'm not born in hell. If I was born in hell, there's no way I could practice the Dharma. I'd just be suffering too much, etc. Right? So these are all about the way of thinking. That's the four common preliminaries. And then we have these four uncommon preliminaries. And this is the difficult bit. What most people think this is the difficult bit. Really, the difficult bit is having the right way of thinking developing the mindset. So the first four is the difficult bit to develop. But we think this next four is the difficult bit. Why is that? Well, what's refuge? Refuge is a hundred thousand prostrations, <laughs> full prostrations. Right. Of course, this is dependent on your ability, right? So somebody who is, uh, there was a guy in our retreat who had an accident. He was paraplegic, not our retreat, sorry, in our um, monastery in Scotland. And so he was wheelchair bound, but he did prostrations. You know, he'd do this, and he didn't just do this in his chair. He would do this in his chair, and then he would kind of fall off his chair to the ground on his knees, and then get himself back up, do it again. So there's always a way for you to do something. Uh, you'll always find a way. There was a guy who came to visit us um, in Nepal, in fact, and he broke his arm just before he came accidentally. Uh, you know, he was had all planned to come to Nepal, and it was all keyed up to do it and then he slipped or something and broke his arm but he was doing prostrations with one arm so like there's all kinds of examples so the first one is a hundred thousand prostrations and then we've got a hundred thousand hundred syllable mantras this is the vajrasattra mantra uh, this is purification so this is to purify negative karma so that we're able to kind of well, really come to recognize the true nature. To be able to practice, we need to get rid of our obscurations. So we do this visualization. It's associated with the tantric practice. So we visualize a deity and uh, say a mantra, and we do that 100,000 times. And then there's the mandala offering. The mandala offering is a form of generosity. So we offer the whole universe, right? We visualize. It's a visual offering. Again, it involves uh, kind of these visualizations in the mind. So we use our imagination to visualize these huge heaps of wealth and that we give it away. So we habituate ourselves to giving up our clinging to the world and also to developing generosity uh, so that we kind of manifest wealth and abundance, right? It's a bit funny saying that because I saw all this stuff on um, online that was basically about <laughs> manifesting abundance. It's some kind of new spiritual practice. It's basically like how you can get lots of money. It's just like the aim is completely the opposite of the spiritual path, but they've somehow mixed it up together. Really weird. And then the final of these four is the Guru Yoga. And Guru Yoga is about developing devotion and kind of belief on the spiritual path. Now the Guru Yoga is the actual kind of uh, cause for us to uh, uh, kind of recognize the true nature, etc. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I just went over the specific kind of uh, meditation focuses and what you have to do. So it's 100,000 prostrations. Of course, if you're elderly, then that's not going to be a full prostration. It might, and also you can do 10,000. There's something called a short mundra, where you do 10,000 repetitions, and there's a long one where you do 100,000. But, um, you know, you have to decide before you start, but you have to have a damn good reason not to do 100,000. So as you can see, this will take time. In retreat, we do the whole thing in four months. So we do the prostrations in just over a month or something like that. It's like, you know, three or four thousand a day. 
really, really busy. But I think what the way we'll do it, it will more likely be maybe 100, or you could do 500 a day if you're really keen. I used to do 500 every day. It's not too difficult if you're young and fit. But 100, 100 a day is doable by anybody. So then we'll have to work out how long that will take. So the teachings will go on and you'll start. You start your Ngundra during the teachings. Um, but the teachings may end before you finish your Ngundra. Then you'll continue to practice and you can send me uh, questions about your practice if you need help. You know, you can text me or we can meet online and I can we can discuss something if you're having some doubts or confusion. Yeah, whatever day and time. Thinking Friday morning Pacific time. But it could be Saturday or Sunday, depending on what people prefer. I recommend starting a free scheduling thing, like maybe double poll to help you with scheduling with our various schedules. Yeah, that sounds great. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, but you know, I'm a bit out of the loop. There's all this sort of stuff that you can use your computer to help you organize yourself. That would be good. <laughs> That'd be really good. Uh, everything will be fine. Yes, Georgios, everything will be fine. AM or PM? Yeah, it'll be 10 or 11 a.m. Pacific, or maybe as late as 12 p.m. Pacific, because there's some people in Eastern Europe who are nine hours ahead. So you have to tell me what's the latest time you can do it if you're in Europe, please. The guy in Malaysia's got no choice, basically. Either he's going to, you know, really go for it and get up in the middle of the night or it's not going to happen. Or maybe if there are some people on the other side of the planet, for example, Australia, etc. So I could do a separate teaching for them. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be before noon Pacific, more, more than likely. Yeah, Bradley, having one hand shouldn't be a problem, I hope. Yep, no problem at all. Like I say, the guy was doing it with a broken arm, so it's even more difficult because his arm was strapped up like this. Uh, there are many song rap songs about manifesting abundance. Really cool to know. It looks really dodgy to me. I mean, yeah, hey, I, I can sell you, you know, <laughs> for six hundred dollars a month, or <laughs> six hundred dollars a year. I can sell you abundance. You can become rich. <laughs> I have to say, it's just a con, really. So I said before, there's no free lunch in the universe. This applies to the Buddha Dharma as well. You don't become rich by you know, wanting money and saying mantras, you become rich through generosity, right? There's no free lunch, it's give and take. And people don't understand this, you know. Anyway, if somebody has mastered abundance, right? They're gonna teach it, right? That means they're a master of abundance. That means they can just manifest money as they like, right? No problem, willy-nilly, you know. Oh, I need a hundred thousand. I need a hundred thousand dollars. Bing. So what do they need to charge you for, right? It's just absolutely crazy. All good, but one question, how is possible to count to 100,000? So we use, we use this to count, but also you can, you take a little bowl filled with stones, and then every time you do one, you put a stone aside. So there's many different ways to count. And also there's the clickers, sheep counters. You can get them everywhere these days. There's digital ones. In fact, they sell, if you look online, they sell these little digital things that go on your finger and you just press the button and it counts. It's actually a Chinese thing because the Chinese do lots of uh, going to temples and saying prayers and things. And it's like a digital mala. And they're really cheap. Uh, we had them. Uh. <laughs> the, the, uh, it automatically did a... What's this? The, the, um, it's doing all kinds of funny... Um, kind of... <laughs> sorry, I don't even know what they're called. <laughs> these expressions. <laughs> you do something like that and it shows an expression. I don't even know where you're supposed to turn this stuff on. Uh -huh. oh, there it happened again. Okay, forget it. I'm getting geared away here. So yeah, these things are really good. In fact, I'll post a link if I find it. Um, we all had them in the retreat. It's easy, right? Because you put it on your finger and you can do prostrations. And you don't have to worry about it. Just, word, just be careful that you write down the number every once in a while because you might be doing it and then you like the battery drops out or something or the battery dies and then you'll lose count. You have to start again. <laughs> okay. Uh, ooh, okay. Yeah, Mary's the scientist. 273.97. Yeah. 
Because it's like scientific accuracy. <laughs> How are you going to do a 0.97 prostration? You're going to actually you're going to do a lot of 0.97 prostrations, a lot of 0.575 prostrations, because you'll do a lot of really dodgy prostrations <laughs> if you're doing 200 a day. There'll be a few tough ones. Actually, what we do is we do more. It, it's 100 100,000, right? But we do 111,000 to make up for these kind of dodgy ones, these not so good ones. Uh, so yeah, basically you do more than you should. And, uh, and then that means that you're okay in the end, because there's always going to be a few duff ones, basically. If you want to do it in a year, then that, I think that's a good number, actually. 300 a day is really doable. 500 a day is quite difficult. Um, but once you're in the habit of it, it's no problem. And in retreat, like I say, we do, um, you know, 3,000 to 4,000 a day. I heard one person uh, claim they could do 7,000 a day. I think that's quite difficult because we were getting up really early in the morning and going to bed at night with almost no break and just prostrating all day long. So I think 7,000 would be difficult, but there is one guy called the Prostration Llama, but he's really short. He's a really short and stocky guy and he does prostrations. It's just like, you know, he just bends his knees. He's hit the ground already, like that. Some people are really fast, but there's no need it's not a it's not a race. This is a problem more in the men's retreats than in women's retreats. They get, become quite competitive. Actually, it was funny. <laughs> it was a funny story. I was in McLeod Ganj, and I was doing my five hundred prostrations a, a, a day. And there was this nun. She was a Galukpa nun, and she just showed up one day, and she must have heard that there was this Western monk doing prostrations, and she came in strutting <laughs> like checking me out like she was it's like a gunslinging or something like that and I thought this is weird and um because I guess she had a bit of a kind of reputation for doing prostrations or something like that because she had like a kind of uh, uh tensor bandages on her arms and things like that and she obviously did prostrations every day and so she kind of checked me out and stood next to me and started doing prostrations but um and so I was playing with her a bit <laughs> I was turning all up the steam a bit and she got puffed out and it was, she was really frustrated. She'd do a few frustrations really quickly. Then she'd stand up and go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> sorry, it was really funny. Um, that goes on, right? We think we should be real kind of saints and things like that in, in retreat, but loads of people get really competitive. It's no need, you know, actually the, when you do it, it's refuge. So you have to really think about your prostration. It's a mental thing. The physical effort makes the mental application that much more effective. If you just zone out and just treat it like gymnastics or something like that, then you'll miss out on your prostrations. Prostrations are about applying mindfulness. It's so important. So anyway, we're going to talk about this in the first class, right? So what kind of mindset do you have to have? If you apply mindfulness, what you'll find is you'll prostrate and you won't even know you're prostrating. But if you just make it into a competition, like, oh, you know, let's say Mary says, I'm going to do four. I'm going to be the first one finished. I'm going to do 400 a day. Something like that. She probably will be the first one finished. <laughs> uh, then uh, you kind of miss the point of it, right? The purpose of prostrations, one of the main things is it's a remedy to pride and ego clinging, right? So you think there's this higher thing that I'm bowing down to, and it's supposed to diminish your pride. And it's important because they say if you've got pride, then you won't develop any qualities whatsoever as long as you have this ego clinging and pride. Okay, let's see, 100 before work and the rest when you get home. Mm, that's a good plan, yeah. You know, I did one mundro when I was in my busy worldly working life, so it is possible. I did it in four months. It was a bit mad though, because I'd have to get up like really early in the morning, I think it was four or five in the morning, and do a thousand prostrations and go to work and come back, it was, it was crazy. but. I was a lot younger than I have to say. <laughs> and I was um I was a yoga teacher at the time as well, right? So especially being an Iyengar yoga teacher, then it's really, really intense yoga. So I was really fit anyway, but um I couldn't do that now. I couldn't work a day job, you know. In fact I had like three day jobs. I was working on the lifeboat, was one of them, rescue lifeboat at the same time, and do my prostrations. But I had no choice because I joined on the Tai Suda Rinpoche Ma Mudra course at the last minute and there was only four months left. So I only had four months to do it. And I thought, wow, no, there's no way I can't do it. But I just went for it and I managed to do it. So. You will always compete with your own self 
Oh, there's no one to complete. Yep. Yeah, don't compete because you'll get injured, right? You won't get injured if you just do 100 a day. And the thing to do is start off by just doing 25 before you even start. Get used to it. We'll talk about all this in the first session. I'm waiting to be broken down into tears, Lama. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a Lama's job to do that to their students, but I, I find that very difficult because I'm not like my Lama who's got compassion. He's got compassion, so he doesn't care if people end up hating him. He'll do whatever it takes to bring benefit. It's, it's kind of scary, right? Because, you know, it's not nice um, challenging people. But really, if you want to progress on the spiritual path, you have to be challenged. And that's part of the point, reason why we do the preliminaries. So anyway, I'm going to try um, to get on top of things. I'm going to be at the retreat center now for um, nine days. And I will try to use my uh, the mobile um, coverage in order to do video calls with people. Hopefully there'll be enough reception. It's kind of, there's poor reception there. And there's no Wi-Fi at the retreat. I could get it installed. They have put cabling in now to the area, just this last year. Uh, but mm, I kind of don't want to do that. I'd rather there wasn't Wi-Fi at the retreat, really. Yeah, so finding your first mallet beads. So I know where I can get these ones. These ones are body seed. And um, I mean, obviously, I can get I can get a batch from Nepal. Problem is the post is too atrocious, but I did find a place that sells these real ones because there's a certain type you should use. And um, so um, maybe I'll, um, I can uh, share a link. I mean, the best thing is if you're given the mala beads, especially by your teacher. So what I should have done was that when I was in Nepal, I should have bought more. I bought some for my students, but I didn't get very many because I was like so rushed. I was working the whole time. It's only got a, a few, but uh, maybe I can bulk buy some and distribute them. I don't know. It depends how many people there are. But I, like I said, I did find a place online that I can purchase them. So we'll see. It, these are called Bodhi Seed, a specific type of uh, bead. And this is the one that the Dalai Lama has said that's the best one. It's also, if you read this ancient text called the um, Notes on the Creation Stage, they also say that this Bodhisid Mala is the best one. It's an overall Mala. For example, you get stone malas, right? So most people like them because they're like, you get rose quartz and pearl and all the kind of, you know, this, uh, this quartz, different types of stone, right? Tiger's eye, for example. And people like them because they look really nice. But these stone malas are actually for wrathful practices like for chasing away demons and things like that. So they're not good for peaceful practices like Om Mani Padme Hum. This one is. Right? This is all round for everything. So this is the best one to have. Okay. Okay. I'm waiting to be broken down. Okay. I guess there's no more questions. And um, I'm going to take my brother to the retreat center to show him the retreat center because he's here. So I'm going to take him for a night. And we're going to do some brotherly bonding. You know, we're both old men now. And we've had many years apart from each other. So we'll do some brotherly bonding. Spend some time together. And then uh, tomorrow I'm going to start work on the retreat. And I'll be working every day for nine days. But again, like I say, I'm going to try to post things. There's a Wi-Fi down at the ferry port. So I might go in the morning or in the evening and post things then. Um, and keep you updated. So again, we're not going to have any kind of class 100% until at least the beginning of May. But I think most likely it's going to be mid-May. I've got to find out exactly when we can get these books or when I can get the ebook, let's say. Uh, I do have the PDF. And so when people commit to the classes, then I can share that PDF. But I won't uh, share the PDF with people who haven't made the decision that they're going to go through with it. Because if you want the book, then you can always buy it, right? So we don't want to like steal it and distribute it amongst people. And so if you don't have any more questions, then I'll leave it there. And again, then uh, I would like to make a donation for the cost of us. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could um, like pitch in or something. Maybe I could order some, something like that. If everybody's interested in Amala. 
Really, the best thing to do is get them from Nepal. But the problem is, if I get them from Nepal, there's no telling when we're going to get them. Like, I could get somebody in the monastery to buy a bunch, and they would do that, no problem. But um, maybe if they DHL them, the sort of courier, we would get them quickly. But I just don't trust the Nepali post. Things just go missing. So, okay. So anyway, let's dedicate any merit from the uh, session we've had for the benefit of others. And again, like I say, it really is my wish that you should find happiness, you know, peace and well-being and progress swiftly on the spiritual path along to awakening. That goes the same for all beings. Because I know how difficult the mundane world is, you know. It's a drag, basically. And as long as we're stuck in the mundane world, then things are kind of irritating. It's never right. And also as you progress on the spiritual path, for example, as you do your, your preliminaries, what you find is people become more sound mentally, emotionally, become more stable and happy people, more resilient. And so that in itself is, is a start. Yeah, I'm going to have fun on the retreat, Mary. I'm going to be like chainsaw I'm kind of raw <laughs> cutting lots of timber and stuff it's good I need it right because I'm here all year for a year I've been here for a year and a half now looking after two elderly people and it gets a bit difficult sometimes it doesn't matter how good your meditation is and sometimes it becomes very difficult right if you don't sleep especially that's the main thing if you don't get any sleep it's very difficult to fix the mind this is what my lama says you know he says it often when we're in meditation as an example, he says, yeah, you could have really high level realization, etc. Let's say recognition. But if you're if you haven't slept all night long and you're sitting in in the session in the morning trying to meditate, you're just falling asleep. It doesn't matter how much I shout at you. You're not going to be able to keep awake. And it's so true. It's really important teaching, right? Because we're in samsara. We've got these really strong kleshas. And so because of that, we're afflicted. And so even if we have got a good understanding of meditation, have good practice, that if the conditions aren't right, then it can be almost impossible. Okay, Simon. Yeah, sure. And you know what? The other thing, Simon, is that uh, these kind of opportunity for the preliminaries comes up all the time. It's a common teaching. And uh, I mean, people even post videos on YouTube. I wouldn't recommend doing it that way because you miss out on the one-to-one -one interaction. We're going to do it over Zoom, right? Oh, that's another thing. You have to have Zoom and you have to have your camera on. Because I have to see that you're listening. If you if you um, participate, then everyone has to have their camera on. That means you're going to be embarrassed, right? If you're falling asleep in the teaching, or if you're, you know, playing with your mobile phone during the teaching, everybody will see you. So it's going to stop people from being random. That's really important. Anyway, Simon, that there's lots of opportunity to do the preliminaries, and many of the Dharma centers, uh, local Dharma centers, teach these things. And like I say, they're all basically the same. So, and I mean, there's lots of great teachers out there. You know, who am I? Uh, may all humans find peace and they realize Buddha nature. How wonderful and Georgios, lovely. Best wishes to everyone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Participate in person is really nice. But these days we've got good options. I think Zoom's got a good option. And we'll see how it goes anyway, right? So uh, anyway, you can keep in touch with me using various text messages over Telegram or Instagram or whatever. And um, I'll try to get more organized. Maybe Mary will help me out. Hello, Monica, uh, to uh, figure out a way, some AI program, sort of self-organize my life, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> and uh, OK, anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to ramble on anymore. So I'll see you, see you later, and I'll try to post some videos uh, from the retreat. You know, I don't know what I can do, but I'll, I'll do my best. So until next time, see you later.